this is Farmland. Coming up. This evening, we are joined by Joe Burke, Senior Manager of Meat and Livestock at Board Bia, for a focused discussion on Ireland's live export trade. We will be talking current markets, new markets, potential for 2019, and Joe will give his outlook for beef prices this Christmas. Earlier this week, Grace Maher, Development Officer at the Irish Organics Association, also joined us in studio to assess the reopening of the organic farming scheme. But first, how have our live cattle exports performed so far this year? Here's Niall Claffey's analysis. Live cattle exports are vital to the Irish beef industry. Exporting cattle out of Ireland provides more competition at the ringside and when it comes to cattle available for slaughter. Data from Borbia indicates that live cattle exports up to October 14 this year were running over 49,000 head or 30% higher than in the corresponding period in 2017. While this is a significant increase on 2017 levels, it must be noted that the biggest contributor to this growth was the number of calves originating from the dairy herd that were shipped to European countries. The chief importers of Irish dairy calves are Spain and the Netherlands, and these markets have seen excessive growth in 2018. Other markets for these type of animals include Belgium, Italy, France and Northern Ireland. Aside from the dairy calf market, the outlook for other live cattle exports in early 2018 was promising. This positive outlook was mostly driven by the prospect of exporting a large quantity of cattle to Turkey. This would be helped by the opening of the market to private sector buyers in Turkey. Over 6,800 fewer cattle have been shipped to Turkish shores this year. In addition, the total number exported to Libya in 2018 stands at 4,500 head. However, a boatload of bulls is expected to leave County Cork in two weeks, destined for Libyan shores. The number of live cattle exported to our neighbouring country, Britain, is running slightly behind last year's levels but not by much. Other destinations in Europe for Irish cattle include Italy, Poland, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Portugal, Romania, Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Meanwhile, other non-EU destinations in 2018 were the Lebanon, Morocco, Russia, Rwanda and Tunisia. Each and every one of these markets, no matter how big or small, is crucial for both the dairy and beef industries going forward. The value of these exports cannot be underestimated. Preventing animals from entering the Irish beef production system will mean that they will not be available for slaughter in Irish processing plants in the future. We're joined now by Joe Burke, the Senior Manager for Meat and Livestock at Board Bia. Joe, thanks very much for coming into us. Uh, Joe, we see in the VT there from Niall that live exports overall are up, but the majority of that is coming from the dairy calves. Um, how important is it that we have access to these markets and is there is there potential there for further scope in 2019? Thanks, Claire. Yeah, we have certainly seen a significant increase in the calf exports. They're up over 50%. And I suppose our key markets there within that, the Spanish market has performed really, really well this year. Um, similarly, the Netherlands are up as well too. Yeah, well, it's definitely important, as you touched on there, that the calves are healthy and that they're good quality, that the buyers are actually very discerning um, when it comes to the quality of the animal that they're getting. And even EU legislation requires that the calves are a minimum of two weeks old before they're allowed to travel. Um, so obviously that impacts on the type of calf that an exporter is willing to buy. Um, and then with regard to their health and their quality, um, really any of these markets and the Dutch market would be the one that would tend to take the lighter calves, but still they have to be 50 or 55 kilos ideally uh, in terms of arrival weight. Um, they have to be healthy. So the first thing that they're going to do when a buyer looks at them is he's going to come in and he's going to see them while they're feeding. They're probably being fed on electrolytes and uh, just see that they have healthy eye, uh, that they aren't uh, suffering from diarrhea or from uh, dehydration or anything like that. Their coats as well too, nice and healthy and shiny. Those types of things are really what um, our ex export buyers and customers are going to be looking at. Yeah, because while our quality on calves is very good, uh, in recent months there has been con some concern about lesser quality and uh, maybe going through the marts. Um, so maintaining that quality is crucial to these markets. Uh, of course, definitely. Um, export buyers will just certainly shy away from those lesser quality calves, whether it be down to their rearing, 
um, that you know they haven't been sufficiently well looked after. That you know certainly an export buyer isn't going to going to purchase those ones. And likewise, um, with regard to their genetics, um, that it's a black and white calf effectively that an export buyer is going to be focused on. It's going to be a Frisian calf. Um, you know some of the lesser quality kiwi cross calves. You know basically they're not suitable for these markets where the end customer is focused on feed conversion efficiency, either how much feed or how much milk replacer they're going to put into the calf in order to produce a good quality saleable either beef or veal carcass. And you know, just the lesser quality animals, they'll eat almost as much as the good quality Frisian calf and uh, they won't convert it into, into a good quality carcass. And Joe, what about the how important the the welfare side is, and how vital it is to maintain those standards? Because you know we're all aware that at peak season there can be some concern and some issues raised over welfare. So how important is it that that is really crucially um, abided by? Yeah, it's hugely important. And the live export sector is heavily regulated, and that is as it should be. Um, it needs to adhere to very high standards, predominantly European standards, and even in fact, the Irish standards in some instances would even go slightly ahead of the European standards. And, um, you know, really with regard to transport, everything has to be done and adhered to with regard to the larages and um, the, the health checks of the animals as well too, when they're unloaded, for example, in France and fed, given a rest period and then reloaded, you know, that that all has to be properly managed. It certainly comes under huge scrutiny. Um, There are animal welfare lobby groups and uh, action groups um, that I suppose monitor us very closely in addition to the regulatory bodies whose job it is uh, to to, uh, supervise this activity. Um, So it is in the public eye. um, And um, certainly we have a positive message heretofore with regard to live exports. Uh, for example, Borbia a couple of years ago followed a number of trucks and filmed um, some uh, publicity footage, I suppose, about that journey and found that the end customer was very, very happy uh, with the way that the cattle were being managed and being delivered and that they all um, you know, very successfully made it across uh, and uh, adapted to their new feeding regime. Um, but that is key. Um, there are a number of, I suppose, animal welfare lobby groups that have a lot of power. Um, and, you know, really, you know, and it's a very emotive subject. Um, young calves are only a few weeks old. Uh, they do have to be managed properly. And, um, you know, so long as we can continue uh, to, to, to manage it in the way that it has been uh, done in the last few years, um, you know, we should continue to be able to hang on to these markets, uh, which, you know, they do represent a very important source of competition, particularly for these dairy bred calves in the springtime of the year. And for the dairy calves, then the main, the main countries uh, for export this year were Spain and the Netherlands, but also Belgium, Belgium and France and, and Italy as well. Um, is there further scope uh, for exports there in 2019 is there are they sustainable markets for our dairy calves they are and yeah because they're dairy bred calves you're not going to be looking at international markets uh, as far as the young calves are concerned it's going to be predominantly european markets that our calves are going to be going to and the the four that you listed there would be the key ones of spain netherlands uh, france belgium italy also takes some calves it's mainly a market for suckler bred weanlings um, but there are, there are opportunities there as well too that hopefully we will see uh, higher numbers of cattle going to other markets as well too further afield, particularly suckler bred weanlings, um, even going into uh, key markets maybe in the likes of North Africa such as Morocco, uh, Tunisia, Algeria. Um, you know, Algeria is a market that technically has opened for Irish cattle but no animals have been sent there yet. And there are still a number of maybe small issues to do with the protocols that still have to be ironed out between our Department of Agriculture and their Algerian veterinary counterparts. Um, but that is one that, you know, certainly we could see finished bulls going to um, in 2019, hopefully. In 2019. And just on the Italian market, at one stage that obviously was very strong for our exports. Do you envisage that that will imp- the situation there will improve or you... you- 
what is the reason behind the, the lack of access there at the moment? Yeah, so we have seen a few more cattle going into Italy this year. About 22,000 have been exported there so far this year. Um, it's up about 20% on last year. Um, but at the same time, as you said, Claire, there have been years when we've been exporting 60 or 70,000 cattle into the Italian market. And in general, Irish cattle prices have been competitive this year. Our prices are down, so maybe farmers around Marts maybe might be surprised maybe not to see more act export activity. Part of that is down to maybe export preferences, even though the Italian market imports about a million cattle every year. The vast majority of those would come from France, um, over 80%. And in fact, the transport cost is something that the French would have as a major advantage that their transport would only be approximately 50 euro per head to truck animals down into the feedlots in northern Italy. Our transport cost in contrast would be over 150 euro per animal just as a result of the ferry cost uh, and all the other I suppose additional costs um, to, to transport those cattle. The other factor then is a kind of a domestic preference so the ideal uh, meat for most of the Italian customers, their highest priced uh, niche product would be their own uh, locally born and reared calves there coming from Italian farms. And their second preference in most cases is the French Weanlands that make up actually the majority of the cattle that are fed in the feedlots in Italy. And Ireland, um, up until now anyway, unfortunately, we would come a slight third after you know the, the French cattle. And in some cases there, there are supermarkets in Italy that you know they would only buy either Italian beef or beef coming from those French cattle. We don't just make it into what they call their filiera or their quality assurance scheme. So in practice then what that means is the beef coming from the Irish cattle that are finished in Italy, in general, that tends to go either in butcher shops or into wholesale or food service outlets, those type of customers. Uh, Joe, you mentioned to me earlier just about this kind of nationalistic movement that's kind of bubbling away there throughout Europe at the moment, and that can also impact on our export potential. It does, Claire. Yeah, certainly, you know, we know in the UK that there is, with regard to beef, um, a preference among some of the customers for their own domestic product, for British beef, for red tractor product as well too, coming from their own quality assurance scheme, and that Irish beef then comes a close second for many of those customers. And, you know, in some markets, uh, there is even a stronger domestic preference. Uh, we have seen this strengthen in some cases, for, for example, in the likes of uh, the Nordic markets in Sweden this year, uh, they suffered a drought similar to ourselves, and that this resulted in a big increase in their own output of beef, that they have more cull cows, for example, to sell. And in fact, the Swedish Farmers Union put pressure on their retailers and on their other big customers to stock more of their own domestic product. And their overall imports have been down. And uh, as a result, Ireland's market share has, has declined somewhat. Mm -hmm. And as we have to bring Turkey in there, I suppose, because, you know, we had very high hopes for the Turkish market earlier this year. It didn't material, materialize for us. Um, what happened there, Joe? And is there potential that in the Turkish market for 2019? Um, that's a good point, Claire, because as you touched on there in 2017, there were almost 33,000 uh, weanlings are, are good quality Irish cattle sent into the Turkish market. In fact, we visited uh, Izmir in Turkey at the beginning of this year with Minister Creed, uh, where we attended a livestock trade fair and met with many buyers. Um, and at that time, uh, there was great optimism that our, our exports were going to increase significantly. Unfortunately, at that time, even we had exported almost 14,000 cattle into the market and we haven't done any further activity since then. It's just down to the economic and the political situation over there that it hasn't lent itself to uh, much imports. In fact, their overall import activity has been down. Um, and it's not just Ireland that has seen um, less demand, but all of their suppliers, even including South America. But I suppose what has mainly happened is that their currency reached uh, a, a, a historic low point, really, of um, seven Turkish liras to the euro. It's now recovered a little. It's around six Turkish lira to the euro now, but effectively it gives them a lot less spending power. And uh, any of the customers that are importing have been buying from much cheaper sources. So some Eastern European countries have still been supplying some cattle and uh, South America as well too. 
um, but at lower prices. And do you anticipate that the situation will change you know, next it, year it, for us? It has been recovering in the last few months and uh, Irish exporters have been talking to existing buyers that they have done business with over the last few years. So, you know, we would hope that it should improve. Um, the, the exchange rate situation has improved somewhat. Obviously, you'd like for that to, to come back to in line um, more with, um, I suppose, prior to uh, the, the, the more recent difficulties um, when we started doing business there first, it was around three and a half Turkish lira to the euro. Um, so at that level, it would look very attractive again, even if it went back down around five. Um, again, we'd be back in line and hopefully our exporters should be able to compete. And now we did have some good news this week in terms of Libya with two boats expect of bulls expected to go out now over the next couple of weeks. Um, how important are those other markets and is there potential there to expand? Um, there is, of course, and uh, in some cases they're going to be competitive as well. Um, but the likes of Libya, we have sent four and a half thousand Irish cattle to Libya so far this year. It mainly represents a good market for uh, plainer cattle, again, coming from the dairy herd, um, particularly bulls. But we had the Libyan authorities that actually, you know, their, their veterinary authorities visited Ireland earlier this year and reviewed our veterinary certificates, opened it up more as well, too, that potentially we could even see exports of breeding cattle uh, and of steers as well as bulls. So. Yeah, it's opened it up and there should be more potential there, as you say, another two boatloads of um, mainly cattle going there for slaughter purposes. Um, you know, it, it, it hopefully should introduce much needed competition um, at the moment when, when prices are, are at a seasonal low point. Uh, so I suppose, Joe, 2018 is really behind us now at this stage. Uh, looking ahead to 2019, can you give us any inclination at all on on potential contracts that could be there um, in other markets for us in 2019. Yes, yeah, so we would be optimistic that Algeria hopefully would come on stream. Um, it's a market that it imports up to 100,000 cattle every year. So even if we were to, to gain um, hopefully a, a reasonable market share out of that, uh, we, tend, we would be competing mainly with imports from France, um, which you know, again, they're, they are dominant exporters, they're big exporters, but uh, the Algerian demand is strong also for finished bulls. Um, other markets then, the likes of Morocco. Previously, we often exported up to 20,000 cattle in a year to Morocco. Um, so that is truckloads of cattle as opposed to boats. Um, but hopefully that should again represent, um, hopefully a viable market for suckler bred weanlings. Tunisia then after that would be a similar market as well too to Morocco there in North Africa that it would also take truckloads of good quality light weanling bulls. And um, then, you know, again, the, the, the European markets, I suppose, that we discussed um, will hopefully be at least as strong as this year um, in terms of their import demand. And Joe, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of trade missions as well. Um, I was recently out on the one to Japan and Southeast Asia, and the, the demand for a fifth quarter out in those countries is huge. Um, but the return to the farmer on the other end is is very it's quite poor. So do you think that there is a scope there for a better return to farmers for the fifth quarter? Yeah, I suppose our exports into international markets tend to comprise of quite a lot of these products you know they're not coming from the carcass as we know it you know the the forequarter or the hindquarter they're coming from these byproducts from various different parts of the animal including the heart and the tail and the liver and the tongue uh, in the case of japan the tongue is a very highly valued item and it sells for you know as much as uh, ordinary carcass meat, I suppose it sells in some cases for up to t the equivalent of 10 euro a kilo. Uh, so it's a valuable item. Um, and Bourbia, in our performance and prospects, uh, we valued uh, the total value of Irish beef offal exports last year at uh, over 200 million. You know, so it is a, a significant contributor to the returns for Irish beef exports. I understand that when a farmer sells his animal to the abattoir, he is paid for the traditional carcass. Uh, so, you know, he's paid on the cold weight of the two sides of the animal that he slaughters. Um, obviously, when the offals are sold as well too, uh, the returns for that contribute to the returns for our exports and for our, our total value of our Irish uh, beef sales, if you like, and they contribute to um, the, the prices then that are paid to the farmers. So there isn't actually 
any mechanism in any country that I know of anywhere around Europe whereby farmers are paid you know, for a price, including the, the weight or the value of their offals. It comes into the, the mix um, you know, that, uh, that, that contributes to, towards the total returns and the overall price then as a result. But do you think it's something that should be looked at? Um, again, the EU dressing uh, specification is, is common across all EU member states. Um, if we were to try and weigh um, you know, the, the price returns, I agree that maybe there should be more, um, I suppose, clarity around what these products are and where they're going. Some of them are also subject to, um, to uh, issues around um, our export protocols. So even the Chinese market has opened up now uh, for Irish beef, but it is only for beef coming from six of our meat plants that are approved. Um, it is only for under 30 months cattle. So we're at, as yet not able, excuse me, as yet we're not able to actually even send offal products to the Chinese market. And it may take some time even to be able to send product there. So market access for offal is equally as much of a challenge as it is for our beef, uh, our beef exports. And there are some challenges there at the moment, particularly in Hong Kong, if I'm correct. That's right. That's right. That the Hong Kong market traditionally represents a very attractive outlet for our offal, but this year it has been much weaker, that it has been more difficult actually even to, to get the product uh, sold over there. And also, you know, the prices have been uh, much lower. And why is that, Joe? Um, overall, I suppose, even though we have access now for our beef exports to China, as I said, for the six meat plants, for under 30 months cattle, um, that it is much stricter in terms of you know, trying to get approval to be able to send offal there. Um, Hong Kong is obviously a neighboring country and they do some inter-trading uh, with uh, mainland China. Um, but that, uh, that trade has been very much regulated and restricted this year. Um, so less free access between the two countries. Talking about beef, Joe, um, we're coming into the Christmas market and generally at this time of year, uh, you know, prices would, would kick in a bit more, uh, but we're not really seeing that. Um, what are your projections for the Christmas market this season? Yeah, so traditionally at this time of year, you would have an uplift as a result of the, the festive boost, if you like, um, that it would be partly due to promotions taking place in retailers uh, where they would um, either discount or promote uh, certain cuts of beef, including the round cuts coming from the hindquarter of the animal. Now that is likewise, it's, it's going to be taken place again this year, um, but it's against a backdrop of there has been a lot more stock in place, not just here in Ireland, but in the UK and in other markets as well too. Uh, there has been more production. Um, and normally you would be coming into maybe a lull period as regards supply that all of the animals um, maybe coming from a grass based production system would already have been marketed and sold, be it, you know, in late September or in through October. This year was unusual and, and somewhat different in that we've had very, very strong supplies right through the autumn and uh, continue to see slaughterings at over 40,000 head uh, at a time when all across Europe as well, too, we've also seen higher production. Um, so um, a lot of the stock that will be used maybe to fill these higher orders from retailers and similarly even from food service customers, from restaurants and so on, maybe over their festive period will be selling more beef on their Christmas menus uh, for um, you know the likes of Christmas parties and things like that in the UK and in other markets. Usually the, the food service demand increases at this time of the year. But a lot of that demand will be met by existing stock that will be coming out of cold storage that, you know, where it has been held over recent weeks. So, you know, even an increase in, in the demand at this time of the year, while we do anticipate that it will kick in, um, you know, it's, it's uncertain as to how much of a boost maybe that that will give farmers um, who will be selling their cattle over the coming uh, fortnight or, or, or pre-Christmas period. Well, Joe, there's loads more questions and topics that I'd love to put to you. But I, one area that I would like to touch on, if you don't mind, um, Origin Green has come in for some criticism in some quarters, you know, over the, the last year, uh, particularly when it comes to maybe um, imported feed, imported and concentrate GM feed. Um, and, you know, some politicians have criticized it as greenwash. Um, and I just, what is your response to those kinds of claims? Um, so 
Origin Green Clear, it's, it's our national sustainability program um, that um, is coordinated by Board BIA, but it's owned and, and effectively, um, I suppose, the, the members of it are the Irish farmers and the Irish food companies and producers. Um, so what it is trying to do is to uh, raise, the, raise the bar as regards our national sustainability. Um, we already have a good news story to tell in that our carbon footprints are low. Um, our grass-based production systems, particularly for our beef and for our dairy, are very efficient in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, thankfully, this is a good selling point for us as well uh, in our overseas markets. Um, but, you know, it, it is a, a voluntary program in that the, the companies and likewise the producers as well too, who sign up to our quality assurance programs, um, in order to participate in Origin Green. Um, they, they put themselves forward for that. Um, in terms of regulation, um, Borbia has a feed scheme whereby um, the feed mills and similarly the farmers as well too that are buying feed, um, that, uh, that is supervised and it is, um, I suppose, accredited in that way. Um, nationally, we do need to import quite a lot of feed, particularly protein feed, because we're not able to maybe produce the, the amount of, of protein that we need. And, and a lot of that is coming from further afield uh, supply. Um, but yeah, I suppose to address um, maybe the, the greenwashing uh, claim, if you like, um, that's certainly not the intention or, or you know, nor would I say that uh, it's a, a fair recognition or validation of the scheme. Uh, it's trying to identify, I suppose, what are our national advantages and to hopefully further improve on those that we have most, in fact, um, over 90% of Irish food exports are now uh, produced and exported um, by members, by certified member companies who are participating in Origin Green. And they make solid commitments as well to, to sustainability in terms of not just raw material sourcing, um, but also to the sustainability or the, or the corporate social responsibility, uh, the, the, the awareness and the, um, the well-being of their suppliers as well as their employees. Um, there's also commitments in there in relation to reducing waste and recycling uh, and biodiversity and water quality. So it is a concrete scheme and nationally we do have to import feed um, and this year in particular as a result of the drought um, that feed requirement went up but particularly on the part of beef and dairy farmers. Um, as I say, the, the quality of that is regulated by, you know, not just the Department of Agriculture and as regards imports, uh, also our feed scheme. Um, but, you know, we continue to look at Origin Green and make sure that it is recognised as a leading, I suppose, sustainability programme. And it has been, the, been key to success for um, Irish products all over the world. Uh, but do you think that there is need for further reviews of it or any, do you think that there's need for any changes to be made? Well, of course, um, like all of our quality assurance schemes, which are now even becoming not just quality assurance schemes, but sustainability assurance schemes. So we are reviewing the standards um, and we'll continue to do that. In fact, at the moment, we're looking at Origin Green in the context maybe of communication around, you know, making sure that our customers, our markets understand it. Uh, know what it stands for. Likewise, even the farmers and the producers that are members of Origin Green, um, you know, that they better understand what they are committing to and what it is hopefully going to achieve for them in the markets. Great. Well, Joe, thank you very much for joining us. That's all we have time for. No problem, Claire. Now we're going over to talk to a farmer in Monaghan about organics and his conversion experience. The organic farming scheme was reopened with immediate effect on Monday, November 19th. The announcement was made by Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, Andrew Doyle. Struggling to make a conventional beef system work, County Monaghan farmer Mark Gillanders decided to make the switch to organic farming in 2008. Prior to starting the two-year conversion process, Mark had been running a dairy calf to beef operation and a herd of suckler cows. Converted to organics 10 years ago and uh, started just producing winelands and got more into it and started to grow a little bit of grain and it snowballed and now I'm finishing all my animals and buying in animals to finish as well as growing more and more tillage and I see the tillage is the best part of the farm. The system I was farming wasn't working 
it wasn't working. I wasn't getting paid for my hours on the farm and it wasn't sustainable. I couldn't see it being sustainable. The way this, the way it has worked on this farm, has it has made the farm a lot more sustainable, able, I mean, now able to live off the farm and have no off-farm job. The farm entered the organic conversion process in 2009 and full organic status for both the land and the produce was achieved in 2011. The conversion process um, worked fairly well here. It's fairly easy to convert a beef farm. It's probably the easiest system of conversion. Yeah, you're not really limited to producing crops that aren't fully organic. You wait until your animals are fully organic. You're just buying a wee bit of, if you need to buy a wee bit of uh, concentrates organic till you get your animals organic uh, certified after the two years. If you were full time or full tillage, you would have to be growing crops that wouldn't be fully organic or you wouldn't probably grow the crops until the third year. Um, slightly harder for tillage, but from a beef farm point of view, it's easier to bring the tillage in. Mark's produce is certified under the Organic Trust and he highlighted both the benefits and the challenges associated with an organic farming system. Benefit, it's a brilliant, it gives you a brilliant interest in farming. Um, really gets you going and really you're able to see what you can do without inputs, without expensive inputs. When you get the system working right and get the soil right, um, you can do really well out of it. Challenges, a few weeds, but a good system of farming, bit of topping, good rotation, a diverse uh, amount of species on your farm is probably the best system you could do. The more diverse your farm is, the more species you grow on the farm, the better you will have your farm. On the farm, the number of acres and tillage has grown over the years, and Mark plans to increase this again next year. The beef finishing enterprise is self-sufficient, and extra cereals are sold off-farm. I sell, sell grain from Mullingar to Donegal, and um, it is the best asset on the farm at the moment, the best system on the farm at the moment. If you can grow grain, if you can grow tillage, there's a vast demand for tillage in Ireland, um, for organic tillage in Ireland, um, with oats, with wheat, with combi crops, with feeding, basically everything. It's, it's very short um, on grain, and if you can do it, it won't do you any harm. Along with growing a range of cereals and combi crops, Mark also utilises forage crop mixtures. I'm certified with the Organic Trust, and I grow a diverse range of crops from multi-species pasture, red clover silage, um, wheat, oats, barley and pea combi crop, uh, forage rape, um, and even trial a little bit of hemp this year. Um, if you had any advice for young or for farmers going into it, get to a good organic farmer or take go to the organic demonstration farm walks and take a good interest in, in, in what you're going to do and have a thought, have a plan in your head. Grace Maher, the Development Officer at the Irish Organics Association, joins me now. Grace, less than 2% of agricultural land in Ireland is in organics and we're actually the second lowest in Europe um, in organics. Why is that? Well, that's an interesting question, Claire. I mean, it's something we're continually asking ourselves um, because it is very low. The European average is about five or six percent, with some countries as high as 20 percent. So at 1.8 percent, it is very low. Um, and we would obviously like to see more farmers coming into organics because the market is there. Um, so there's various reasons why people are slower to convert. One can be, you know, the age demographic because people don't like to take on something new. Um, another can be that people will say, well, sure, we're almost organic anyway, but we just won't bother with certification, um, which for us is a frustrating response because obviously the market is there and the market wants more organic products. So, you know, looking forward, we would just like to see more farmers in Ireland consider the organic option because there's certainly market opportunities out there. But to explain why we're so low, um, it's, it's very difficult to explain. 
because the Irish agri-food industry really does sell itself on the clean, green, environmentally sustainable, environmentally friendly, which are all uh, part of the organic story. Are there limitations there in terms of access to market opportunities? Um, well, yeah, I mean, you identify that Ireland is, you know, known as a, the, food, the food island in terms of green food production. And um, from our point of view, organic is obviously the seal of approval on that because it's a legally binding term. It's the highest form of food production certified around around the world. So, I mean, for Ireland, there's obvious, obvious marketing opportunities um, from other parts of the world who are looking for organic products coming from Ireland. So, so sometimes, you know, the fact that, yes, we've got such a strong brand can actually you know, be difficult for organic to actually compete in that market space. But we're certainly beginning to hold our own. Um, and we're constantly being contacted by big players abroad who are looking for certified Irish organic products. In terms of the criteria to be certified organic, can you just outline what needs to be achieved? Okay, so essentially, if you're a farmer considering organic uh, farming, you need to go into conversion. So there's a two-year conversion period. Um, and once you get through that two-year conversion period, you get your full organic symbol where you can sell your product as organic. So in that two-year conversion period, you must farm organically, but you can't sell your produce as organic. Um, but once you have your full symbol, um, you're, you're free to, to trade on the organic market. So that's the process um, in terms of the certification side. And then every year you must renew your organic certification um, with a company like the Irish Organic Association to keep your organic status. And obviously that two year window must be quite challenging if they can't sell as organic and they're converting over. Yes, it is a challenge for some people, but you can obviously sell it into the conventional market. So, I mean, if you're, if you're already trading in the conventional market, your products go into the conventional market. Um, so, so for some people, it's, it's not really a major issue. And that two year period is actually welcomed by a lot of farmers. Initially, they see it as maybe a, a drawback to going organic, but actually what a lot of them will say to us after the two years, oh, it was really good to have that two years to just dip your toes into the market see what's going on, like to learn about organic production, because obviously it's a different production system. So, so that two year period, and it actually goes really quick. So overall, I think farmers are actually quite happy with the conversion period, even though initially they may see it as, as a drawback to going organic. Currently, there's about 1,700 or so in organics, or farmers in organics at the moment in the scheme. Um, and we'll get on to the, the, the reopening of the scheme in a minute. But just in terms of what farmers, uh, what enterprises, what production enterprises are really achieving uh, good, good results at the moment in organics, where are you seeing uh, that the the most gains are being made? Well, the most gains, I suppose, um, tend to be on the cereal end of things because there's a, a big demand for products like organic oats, um, which is going for human consumption. Um, obviously, then there's animal feed demands, dairy, horticulture. I mean, anecdotally, a lot of our, our growers that, that we work with, they can't keep up with demand. Um, so right across the board, um, there are opportunities. A little bit slower in some of the, the traditional markets, like the lamb, where just basically people aren't eating as much lamb um, and that's both conventional and organic so when you you take a premium product and put it on the market it can be a little bit more challenging to get the premium price so but overall I mean the sector is extremely buoyant um, and really those areas are you know where there's market deficits there's certainly opportunities for farmers. And the department has reopened the scheme this week on a targeted basis. What's your response to the announcement? Well, obviously, we welcome the opening of the scheme because we've been calling it for it um, for the last number of years. Um, and it is a targeted scheme. So it's focusing on tillage, horticulture and dairy. Um, and that's essentially based on market demands. This is where the market deficits lie. Um, we're importing products in those areas to meet the current uh, demand and that's not to look at future growth opportunities. So it makes sense with a limited budget that is available from the department for the organic farming scheme to target uh, the scheme. So um, yes, like we would like to see it like broadly open and we would like to see it kind of open on an annual basis to be inclusive for all farmers. But at the moment, this targeted scheme is, is based on market deficits. So what about then the beef sector and the sheep sector? Should farmers in those areas still consider joining Join um, the scheme. Well, actually, from organics, one of the things about organic farming is we get a lot of mixed enterprises. So a lot of organic farms are doing some tillage, some livestock. So, you know, sometimes it's not as easy to get it just a straight enterprise. So farmers who are certainly in a mixed enterprise should definitely consider applying this time around. We're not 100 percent sure what the budget is. So, you know, how much the scheme can actually accommodate. But I would certainly to say to, to farmers um, to certainly apply 
if they're interested in coming into organics. And our indication are there's a lot of farmers who are interested in coming in. Um, and the scheme closes on the 19th of December. So it would certainly be worthwhile applying. It's a tight window as well for applications. Absolutely, it's a tight window. So, um, you know, the phones have been hopping um, in the Irish Organic Association um, and we're trying to get encourage farmers to not leave it to the last minute and to, to get their applications in because essentially you've got to call the Irish Organic Association, submit your paperwork, then we're, we issue which will license and then that license has to go to the department and then go on to ag food. So the process, you know, it'll take a few days. So we're encouraging farmers to, to not leave it till the 18th of December. And just to break it down into kind of more specifics, Grace, what kind of um, financial rewards can, can a, a producer make, say, on a litre of milk or on a kilo of beef if they convert to organics? Um, so in terms of prices, it depends on your market. In the organic sector, we have quite a lot of people who are selling direct, so it would be a higher proportion than in the conventional sector. So it really depends on, on where your product is going once it leaves the farm gate. Is it, are you selling direct? Because we would have a lot of horticulture producers, which are obviously targeted in this scheme, who are selling direct. Um, so they're at farmers markets, they're selling online. So their returns are higher than if they're dealing in, in larger volumes with supermarkets. Um, we have a lot of people people in dairy who are selling direct. Um, so it, it's quite, you know, in terms of returns, um, to kind of give a broad overview of the returns, it's a little bit challenging. So say, say for instance, organic oats, um, roughly on a hectare um, of organic oat production, you're probably talking about the region of about 800 euros profit um, once your, your margins are, once your costs are taken out. And what about the pitfalls, Grace? What kind of advice would you give to, to farmers that are considering joining? Where are you seeing the pitfalls over the last few years? Well, generally speaking, what we're seeing in the last few years and the last scheme opened in 2015 is that farmers are actually coming in quite prepared. They've done their research. They've gone to visit organic farms. They've spoken to organic farmers. They've spoken to us. So they've done a lot of their research and converting to organic production isn't something that you just do overnight. Um, and that actually stands to a lot of farmers. So once they've come in, they, they know where they're going to sell their product. Um, but one of the challenges is about the, is actually on the production side. It's a different mindset to producing food organically. You can't go out with the bag of fertilizer, with the pesticides. So you need to be very organized. You know, you need to... You need to yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah. On everything. On the crop side of it, you need to employ a quite a strict rotation system, which will help with your soil fertility, which will also, you know, help if you run into problems with pests and disease. So you're always trying to reduce your exposure to problems on the farm. On the livestock side of it, you know, you have to be prepared. I mean, obviously, if animals are sick you need to have a herd health plan like drawn up so um, so there's a lot of preparation involved in organics and the old saying of you have to be a really good farmer to be really good conventional farmer to be a good organic farmer still holds true um, but generally speaking when people come into organics there's a very low fallout I mean we probably over the years we, we've looked at our statistics and there's probably about three percent fallout which is very small so when farmers come into organics even though initially they might be a little bit Weary, just you know a little bit nervous really is what it is but once they come in they really like the farming system and very few of them actually leave even though they come in initially you know a bit skeptical and agriculture faces just such challenges down the road in terms of climate change and um, meeting emission targets and farming sustainably do you think that do you envisage that there will be a bigger move away from more kind of conventional methods of farming in the future towards organics because it tends to tick more of those boxes? Well, absolutely. And the climate change organic farming delivers, you know, um, and I think consumers are becoming more aware about that. And the question of delivery of public goods, you know, from consumers demanding delivery of public goods for, for food that's being produced within the EU. And that's what a lot of the, the subsidy system is based on. So I think we have to seriously address our climate change targets. Um, and obviously the issue of Ireland paying out large sums of money in terms of fines will concentrate the mines because at the moment we're not managing to decouple our, our, you know, our, our, our emissions targets with, with regard to what we're producing. So I think we need to seriously look at climate change and organic has lots of options to offer on, offer on climate change. And that alone, I mean, it delivers, you know, it's what the consumer wants. We look at the European market and um, the European organic food market has grown exponentially. It's currently valued about 33 billion. And I think Irish farmers need to actually step up and claim a little bit more of that market. I mean, Germany, the market, the organic market is worth 10 billion. 
billion. France, it's worth 7 billion. The Danes are up there as well. And those countries are open for business. They want product, they want organic product. And I think Irish farmers have a real opportunity on their doorstep. I know it's challenging in terms of the market ahead with Brexit. We don't know which way things are going to go. But in terms of the market is there for organic product and also, as you say, delivering on, on environmental benefits. And I think organic thinks, takes a lot of boxes in those contexts. We're also looking at the reform of the common agricultural policy now post-2020. What changes would you like to see being brought in for the organic scheme into the future? Well, obviously, we'd like to see more funding committed towards the organic farming scheme um, or whatever scheme is introduced post-2020. Um, and what we would also like to see is, you know, if a scheme such as the organic farming scheme is included in the RDP, that it would be opened on an annual basis. So the ad hoc you know, situation at the minute opened in 2015, the next tranche opening now in 2018 for a month, it can be quite difficult for farmers to actually plan on that basis. Um, so we would like to see a scheme opening annually um, so farmers can come in and it would be a more sustainable approach to it. Um, but obviously overall in the RDP, we would like to see more mention um, and more support going towards organic farmers. Grace, thanks very much for coming into us. We'll leave it there. So that's all we have time for this week. Thanks to our guests and to our sponsors, Homeland. If you want to get in touch with the Farmland or Agriland teams, you can call or email us directly or message us on our social media channels. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.